It's a great honour to be here. Uh, slightly terrifying, but I've had the most amazing buzz over the last two days watching all these amazing things that are happening. And um, it's down. That's probably better. Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> Good. Um, and I just want to sort of extend the discussion a little bit um, via a little detour through some um, pertinent points about the uh, context in which we all live, I think. Um, because sort of it's the elephant in the room, really. Um, and uh, much as Te Papa is absolutely brilliant, we couldn't have an exhibition like that in Australia yet. Um, so I just want to talk, because from my perspective, not as a programmer, although I have done development and worked with engineers nearly all my professional life, um, but as a person who has always been absolutely fascinated with the way the role of technology in society and culture and how they all shape each other, um, thank you, um, I, I just want to talk for a little while about sort of how um, mapping is in a cultural context and a social context and how it is evolving, which we certainly have seen this. And I want to just give some honour uh, to Paul Ramsey, who really alerted me to the relationship between open and communal and the rest of the economy. Uh, nothing could be more obvious between the relationship between open source and the rest of the ICT industry. Um, but also, I'd really like you people, perhaps, to help us work out how we might also change the relationships um, within the broader cultural community and start putting revaluing communal um, and communal effort and volunteering um, more widely outside just the ICT sector. Um, so location, meaning and purpose in my particular field really governs everything that everyone does. And um, the, because everybody has a different experience, the, one of the perhaps failings of the broader public popular science is to believe that everyone has the same reality. In fact, that is never true. And, it, and I think mapping, and this is probably what drives me to be here, has the biggest potential of any technology we have invented to show people the different ways people see the world. Um, I just had that little, uh, the links I won't use because I'm going to run out of time, but I put them in so if this is up somewhere people can look them up. And, and the um, reference there is to how we have an enormous amount of data which mostly no one can understand and no one is using. And I would just like to propose that the mapping GIS technologies give us the opportunity to help them understand what we're finding out on the ground in ways that they care. Um, Dark Emu was mentioned earlier. I'd just like to pay homage because I think it's the, most, the best book there is in my country about what we've forgotten. Um, we need to remember that as change roars on, sometimes we throw out the baby with the bathwater. And to have a culture, the only one on the planet, that has been continuous for 65,000 years, just at this time in human history, might be valuable. And, um, <laughs> and, and that indigenous cultures in general have knowledge that as they've been colonised has sometimes been swept aside, very sadly. And I think that that um, is really important. Um, If we are using mapping symbols and cultural values, they all change over time. So the most recent ones that are pushing in, and my observation is that the usual people in, in um, the ICT industry are not used to mapping things like sustainable development goals. Uh, in fact, I had an interesting conversation in Black Mountain with the CSIRO boffins who are commissioned to do this for Australia because they have mostly measured geological things that are permanent in terms of human, 
human feelings. So when I said, but you won't, I'm a psychologist, the only thing I know about measurement in psychology is you're never measuring what you think you're measuring. So if you're measuring poverty, how will you know <laughs> that that's how people are perceiving it and what the impact of that is? Okay? Um, I think mapping it uh, rather than giving the norm, which is the usual habit in the public media, might be really useful in areas like this. Okay? In Australia, I suspect by the end of this summer, water, too much of it or too little of it, will be the biggest issue. So m real technologies to map every aspect of our water are going to be critical for the survival of lots of towns in Australia. Um, and every culture has knowledge systems that have evolved and are evolving over time. So there's been a lot of concentration on, and I think it's really valuable, and I've certainly been part of it all my life, in evolving a, a sort of global culture, a one-size-fits-all that allows us all to interact with each other. And that is hugely valuable. But I also think we need to learn to manage diversity. And mapping gives us that occupation, that, that possibility of allowing data that is local to also be collected and mapped where it's needed. Uh, just as an example, there's a little piece of Google um, about Wellington, and you'll notice most parks are just green. Next to it is a piece of art, which is indigenous, which is much more detailed and complicated and below it, uh, if I just morph it, I think, all the things that would be really important in a small piece of landscape if you were Indigenous, that person thought were meaningful. So getting down to the fine grain, now we have the technology to do it, really important for ecological and, and also, I suspect, for food development and survival. Um, Different people doing different things. Scientists measure one thing. Indigenous groups, in my experience, if you take the mapping, look at something else. Changes over time mean land and sea, for that matter, is valued differently. So in 2016, the centre of Australia, and we'll come to it again in a minute, when, a century ago, is now highly valuable because it has less light interference. We can have the SKAs. Telescope, it has value in the spatial industry because of the lack of interference from everything else, okay? But in 1914, <laughs> that is how someone drew Australia, okay? And the point is that that, that seriously re represents roughly the great Australian dream, um, recent film by Stan Grant, um, of ha what is actually valued by some groups in Australia still. You know, we, we, you have to understand this. Culture rolls along at a different pace sometimes. So you'll notice all the coal deposits are very prominent and very important. The useless area, of course, turned into an excellent place for our British um, people to try out their nuclear weapons, OK? Um, similarly, really, that arid zone is still representative right up to today. And in fact, if anything, the green bits are, are shrinking back in population and services. Um, the centre is still really badly serviced in Australia. So you may think we're a big island, but actually a lot of us is not terribly well looked after. Um, I found this amazing, and I put the link in, if anyone's interested later. Um, um, oh, sorry. Thank you. Oh, what have I done? No. That's the way. Let's go back. Just sorry. There. No. No. There. Um, sorry, people. Um, don't jump up just yet. Um, <laughs> um, amazing paper. It's written, written as a project recently. It's on our um, National Energy and Environment um, Federal website for the, for the government. And it is, um, and it is a really interesting exploration of what mapping means when you're trying to be regulatory, colonial, indigenous, and heritage valuing, all at once. 
Um, for anybody who's interested in those dilemmas of mapping and manage, finding your way, it is a seriously interesting article. Um, it, they very much consulted without value um, across all those groups and the sort of the problem of, of selecting um, an Indigenous representation of the Canning stock route, a stock route with all the, um, you can see why it was so important indigenously because those are, those are um, song lines crossing it um, <laughs> in old times, but also, um, oh, why is this running away from me? Yeah. And the final map they came up, up with was, was this, which was to choose. Now the yellow one is a song line, okay? The darker, darker orangey colours are exploration routes. You can see going into the desert wasn't such a good idea. The dark orangey red is stock routes, and you can see the Canning stock route running up and crossing, running along the song line where all those water holes were. Okay, and that was a highly contested part of colonisation. Why did they build the stock route? Because you could grow cattle and meat down in the south around Perth. But the mines, which was why Australia was colonised in the first place, were up in the north. So these are the histories behind what's been still contested today. We just recently closed um, Uluru from being climbed on and it's caused cultural clashes. I just, from my um, personal interests, um, the simple little steps in defining the problem, analysing the key variables, selecting a strategy and selecting tactics, in my view, is done very narrowly in each discipline that just studies anything. So people tend to only take in the key variables in their dis discipline, in their technology, in their regulatory framework, in their little bit. So very rarely are our problem solving collective or broader, and I think um, this business of putting together a more holistic view is my challenge um, because and checking the result rather than defending it is also helpful. What I've loved about the last two days is the number of people who've been talking about consulting with people and evolving stuff. Um, in our social structures that's still quite difficult and any of you working for government or for big corporations know that it's just it's structural it's not personal it's not about the people being bad it's structural in our culture um, and it's reflected very much some of these old beliefs um, in even this is a little clip from some notes on the layered treatment of raw data for transport um, um, driverless car development, okay? So we must, you know, and the, the capability is evolving, provides a glimpse into the potential, capturing and managing stories about places commence at the bottom of the Maslow hierarchy, the engineering perspective, which is got to be about physiological needs, food, warmth, rest, security and safety, okay? Now, this is entrenched in regulatory thinking everywhere. And it, the research has been done in aged care. We have a minor problem in Australia. I'm keeping the, it's not that I'm just only parochial. It's just that I can talk about Australia. I'm not qualified to talk about anyone else's problems. Um, but in aged care, we have a huge problem, largely because not even physiological needs and safety needs have been cared for. But if you do the research and get feedback from really well-resourced aged care, um, you find that um, the top layers of belongingness, loneliness, huge problem, and so on, are barely thought about in regulatory systems. If you think about work systems, um, actual self-actualisation in very few workplaces is um, top of the list in what's to be done. And that's probably why a lot of you do um, your open source programming um, in your spare time. It's not just that you can't make a living out of it, it's also because that's worth your while to do that. Um, and I think we're rapidly coming to the, and this is my plea, and then I'll move straight on from the psychology, where we might need to 
mobilise the community and build creative agency and self-actualisation in the community to move fast enough to get on with getting on with using the technologies we have productively in society. Because I think the pressure is possibly too much for our regulatory environment to move fast enough. Um, Adam Jacobi, that's the link down there, has a really interesting um, talk about um, how there's just a basic conflict between power and democracy in, in, in Western society in particular. And so I think it's quite interesting. Um, and I think we need to be just deeply thinking about how we can mobilise and not wait for the whole group to come with us. Um, so we, could, we sort of have this business as usual, which is highly specialised, and much as I totally am sympathetic to your need for professional development and to look after each other as a community, what I'm asking you is to also think about who else you could collaborate with and um, who else might you might volunteer to mentor. I really was impressed with the, the geo the geological um, lessons for geologists, okay? What other areas that you don't normally mix with could you teach something and then start to build out to? Um, and we seem to have got into this sort of space in the, in the mainstream, which is, um, which is very much um, a fairly fixed hierarchy which privileges compliance. Our education system, very much so increasingly at university level. And I think the way in which the open source community works, but is no, there is now no reason in social media works. Twitter, for example, is a universe that looks like the, the um, right-hand side from your perspective. <laughs> so I'm sort of thinking that one, I've been very involved with Digital Earth, not the, not the spatial company, but the global organisation of Al Gore's. Um, we had a Digital Earth project at Griffith University and really the story behind that is that we have known for a year proposed that there would be a global warming impact from fossil fuels last century. It would, that was just an opinion because he worked it out mathematically and it wasn't for open. But I was taught about it when I went to university as a problem in zoology. So I think, you know, we have a, um, we have a, um, real need at the moment to re-socialise science back into the culture and the community. Um, I want to talk about two projects. It's good I've got here without uh, <laughs> Daniel leaping to his feet. <laughs> uh, uh, and get down to some practical. Um, the first one's Nature Map. Um, I don't think I'll click the link, but it's there for you who, if you want to get in and have a look. Um, it's interesting. It's been built by Aaron Classens and a group. It started in land care. All you need to participate is a mobile phone and an access to the internet. And the whole system now is quite stable, um, operating in several geographic areas and can open up anywhere else that can pay for some cloud rent. Okay? So it's quite easy to access and not expensive. It, um, it's basically aimed and was developed with the sort of people who belong to land care. So it's largely retirees and young people who like to understand native plants and animals, walk in the environment a lot and so on. And what it does is let them map, because phones now can give GIS bearings, um, mapping, but it also has, and this is the part that I think is really interesting, it has a moderation layer in the whole system and in the website where the local knowledge can be respected, rewarded and used and then only later does the national database um, check, check, you know, what, what, say, a specimen, if you take a photo of a lizard and you're five, your local person can probably tell you it's a skink but if you take a photo of something rarer, it might be um, some, some other more expert academic that just gets called in when no one knows. So that you're layering up the knowledge and then putting it out. Um, the website increasingly um, has uh, 
a very inclusive, respectful, the whole development's been done with a community, with several communities now. Um, it recognises active participation as a contribution to a communal thing and rewards it. So it's not done for someone, it's done with people. Um, uh, and it also um, lets the um, members see progress in the community. Um, it goes, CSIRO is managing the database at the moment. So it goes into a national database, you get a little email, even if you're five, saying thank you so much for your contribution. It has been added to the, to the database. And if it is rare, or increasingly in Australia, if it is a specimen of something that's moved further south than we've ever seen before, that is noted for you, so you're informed. Um, oops, this is awful. Just go back. Um, the second project is this Building Sustainable Communities. Now, Joseph Murdoch and Ricky Talbot did this for me. That's their vision of what a sustainable community would be. They're both Indigenous. They're both quite... quite um, and I think that, that blew me away when we first did it. Because it's really about everything, just about. <laughs> and I think it sort of throws out the challenge. Um, this project has got rather um, bigger than I had possibly imagined. Um, but, um, and I'll just morph that so it's probably a little bit easier to read, so it's just the thing. But it's, the whole thing is going to change. If the temperature change, the conditions change, the laws are going to have to change. Everything will need to change. And that's what happens normally during war. Hopefully, that isn't going to be the reason. But mob mobility in Australia is, for some weird reason, a very hot topic. Um, we probably are expecting 60 million people in the near north to need to move. And the key goals for the project are that and regenerative. And I think I've missed my... No, no, yes, I have. That is the set of relationships that are building around it, just in our area. And that, those are the things where we're actually collaborating. Up, starting at the top, we have four or five Indigenous businesses passionate <coughs> about getting involved in this. We are collaborating with a number of other ICT businesses, businesses, in, in Brisbane, including one, Real Serious Games, which is a gaming and VX education product builder. Because one of the things that we have recognised is we're going to have to speed up the way we <coughs> teach people to use things, and we might need new technologies for that. Um, we have the Think Lab is just being set up as a not-for-profit, which will sort of hold it all together. The university research at the moment is mostly UQ, with some interest from QUT. Um, the UQ um, university, the most interested, apart from the environment department, is the um, COFI, which is the Queensland... Um, uh, it, it's, there's a unique Australian Foods Institute, which is researching native plants and medicinal and nutrition. Okay? Um, we have a big regenerative agriculture section emerging. The councils are really important in people growing regenerative gardens. Um, we have schools wanting to grow the gardens to teach science because science is very boring in school in the curriculum as it's delivered. But the kids lit up when we said, well, why don't we put solar on the top, start learning how to do all this. You might need to know. And in, in low socioeconomic schools, which are already using food bank in <coughs> Brisbane, just so everyone understands, um, growing, having a decent veggie garden is a seriously good way to learn to use sensors and mapping and everything else. Um, and we think we'll use Nature Mapper because we can use local knowledge <coughs> as well as expert knowledge. So it does, stops being us and them, it starts being our elders, and then we have some guidance. Um, and the spatial industry thinks it's absolutely wonderful because Nature Mapper would make an excellent introductory um, activity for primary schools to GIS mapping and data that everyone can do and then we can negotiate with the TAFE and the universities to have further courses once the kids are involved. So it's like, uh, and the Citizen Science Project, which Nature Mapper really is, it's a citizen science platform, 
um, are champing at the bit to get people involved and feeling they can do something, whoever they are. Not be having it done for them. I think we're getting tired of that. It's not going to happen very quickly. Um, I think we need to start mobilising this. What I'd like you people to think about is how you could use all this. Because it's a huge force. And if you want new people coming into this community, this is probably a pathway that's going to really appeal to a lot of them. <coughs> so, um, the purple is the services we can think we can offer. Back, back to um, my earlier slide, um, I think if we can build an infrastructure like this, um, that, is, that is linked and holistic, it can offer services. So the traditional knowledge database could easily offer services out to government and the tourist industry, for example. Um, we're already collaborating with businesses and researchers in various areas, okay, to build this up. So that, that you know, so it's not science or indigenous or government. It's actually putting the three together to build something better. Um, and the bottom bit is the bit that I think in the long run needs either help from people like you, and I'm putting this out there, um, or even in education support, um, or some funding, which I think we will be, you know, we will get. We're just getting on with the grant program now, okay? So I'm just putting it out there because I think we may need to do this generally, and I think humans sort of, uh, there have been a few discussions here about open source projects, just to relate it back, and wondering why they faded out. Um, I think the same thing happens with civilizations. They either evolve or they fade. And because I know we only see what we want to know about, um, I think we need to be thinking about these things and what our reality <laughs> needs to be and what, how virtual reality can improve our physical reality and help us live in it. So I've come up, probably raised more questions than I've answered, even for myself with this talk. This is the last lot. Um, but I think we need to ask ourselves, what would it take to own, create, be responsible for, use and share a communal map over time? In any area. It's not how we, certainly not how people like me, some of you think of it like this, but a lot of people are not using real-time change maps, except perhaps from Bureau of Meteorology. Um, and they're not seeing the change over time even when they do get those because they get the static map publicly. So um, I think people need to be able to see the change that's happening in, in, in their <coughs> space, in their place. Um, and I think that... Um, the potential economic value of this is huge to you first, probably, as the first layer, and then secondarily into the rest of the economy. But I also think the impact of you mapping and using different knowledge systems we really need to consider. It's been discussed quite a lot here, which thrilled me, um, and I know QGES and other people are you know, really working on this, um, because I think it's not just about different languages. It's actually about finding ways to raise the priorities of different knowledge systems in different places because that, they haven't just appeared there because they're weird and ethnic. They are there because of wisdom of experience for a long time in that place. It is different living in New Zealand than it is in Brisbane and there are very big reasons why people know different things. And I think the... Um, sort of voluntary citizen twinning of reality in maps would have a huge influence on how our democracies work if we didn't think of government maps being the authority and citizens being told what to do. So with that, I'll say thank you.